lactose intolerant. Oh, man. Here we go. So, I know. One, yeah. two. two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Will you come to prayer with me this day? Loving God, as we come together, and as we look at those sacred cows that might be getting in the way of our lives, let us be the doers of your good deeds, but allow us to remove and even push over those sacred cows that may be getting in the way. Let us open our hearts this day, but evermore let us open our minds so that we may be the receptors of the words that were about to be spoken. So I ask now that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken on this day, and the words that come from my mouth, along with the meditations on each and every one of our hearts. Let them ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Well, if you've been tuned in over the last how many weeks, you know that we're in this series called Cow Tipping. And I think we've come to that conclusion that you just can't, no matter how hard you try, tip over that 1,500 pound piece of livestock. And yes, it is safe to say that we are determined that we all carry around those special cows in our life, those sacred cows. Yes, sacred cows that we defined as those being that there are unreasonably immune from criticism, question, or change. Regardless of all of this, did you know that each and every one of us worries about something? At some point, at some time, we all worry about something. And worry happens to be a sacred cow. It's that go-to emotion that we go to when it appears to be, well, somewhat off kilter, maybe especially at things in our lives or things that are happening that are just not right. It's that sacred cow because they worry about something and they can control it and they like for whatever reason it may be that they are in control. They have that power. We know in reality that that's far beyond the truth. If anything, worry can cause us to be out of control. Worry robs us of our peace. It robs us of our joy. It robs us of contentment. And quite honestly, it robs us of that abundant life and connection that Jesus has the ability and is wanting to do in our lives as we serve God each and every day. Now, if anyone in the Bible is good reason to worry, it was the Apostle Paul. Paul was a missionary preacher and a church planner after he had come to Christ. He was going from city to city, making disciples, leading people to Jesus, while standing and starting all of these new churches. And one of his favorite churches was the Church of Philippi. And of course, he wrote a letter to them. However, Paul was troubled by something that was happening with the particular church of Philippi. So what was the trouble, you may ask? Well, there were church members, and they were in disagreement with one another, and he was troubled that there, he wasn't there to help them. You see, there were these two women in the church that were at odds with each other. They had conflict, and it was causing a division in another church at the same time in Rome that Paul had the opportunity of starting as well. And Paul was not available to address these issues that were going on in either church. Now, when Paul was writing this letter to the church of Philippi, he was in prison facing possible death, being executed. And while he was writing the letter, he actually was chained to a Roman soldier in the prison. I don't know how bad that might be, but, but he was chained to a Roman soldier. And not just sitting in the cell, he actually had time to write and to explain to the Church of Philippi. And if you listened to the epistle lesson this morning, it was to them as well as to us of how not to worry and how to actually tip over that particular sacred cow of the worrywart. 
So what is worry? Well, the Greek word for worry is translated as being anxious. And it is literally means to be pulled if in different directions and different ways. Now, peace and hope can pull us in one direction. And on the other side, worry and fear can completely pull us in a different direction. It can even pull us apart. And did you know that the old English word for worry comes from an old German word, which means to strangle? And that's exactly what it does. It strangles and chokes the life out of us. Even the medical field has taken real estate in their opinion about worry. It is that has that definite proven consequences. We can struggle with ulcers, headaches and backaches, sleep issues, it can be affecting our thinking, even our digestion. It can even affect our coordination. That explains probably my lack of coordination sometimes. But yet again, the biggest impact that it has on us, it robs us from so many things like our peace and our joy and our contentment. It even robs us of our happiness. I heard it said a while back that a fog enough to cover seven city blocks and at least 100 feet deep is composed of less than one gallon of uh, one glass of water. Now, if you divide that into 60 million droplets, that means that a few gallons of water could literally drown out an entire city. And that's how worry works. Now, usually we begin to think about something that is very small, and all of a sudden it takes a life of its own. And from there, it begins to grow in our minds. And when it consumes us, there you have it. We created that monster inside us that could paralyze us for life. An author by the name of Warren Worsby says that from a spiritual standpoint, worry is a combination of wrong thinking, which is in our mind, and our wrong feeling, which is our heart about circumstances and people and things. I'm sure at one point in time that we have all had things in our lives, but all at one point, people have said to you, why don't you just quit worrying? Stop worrying about that. What are you worrying for? But we all know that those words are sometimes easier said than done. Worry can be a powerful joy stealer. If not that sacred cow, it's a huge one. But if you dig deep enough, more than likely, it has generational roots that come along with it. Chances are, if you're a big worrier, that one of your grandparents were a big worrier as well. Or your parents. All big worriers and being worries inside of that, which takes more good intentions to claim a victory. But Paul tells us that if we are going to tip over this powerful sacred cow of worry, that we have to allow the power that we find in God and God's word along with that security that we find in Jesus to allow to permeate in our hearts as well as our minds. We need to allow the peace in which we find Jesus to become that replacement of the worries that overwhelm us each and every day. Some may ask, how do we do this? Well, Paul actually talks about how we can tip over the sacred cow or this cow of worries. One of the very first thing Paul says is you have to have just the right kind of prayer and the right kind of praying. So Paul is telling us that we need to address our worries and by taking everything, not just a few things, but taking all of these things and everything to God in prayer. An author by the name of Tony Evans shares this principle and says, the more you worry, the less you pray. The more you pray, the less you worry. This word prayer is beyond this point that becomes that big umbrella. And while it does all of this, it carries that idea of worship and adoration and devotion. Whenever we find ourselves worrying about something, the very first thing we should do is go into a corner or a quiet place and worship ourselves with God. Worship allows us to focus our minds and our hearts and that greatness of extreme powers. It helps us to realize that God is that big person to solve the problem. Paul tells us if we want to pray peace into our worries, 
that if we don't start off by just coming into God's presence and dumping it all down on the floor, that things could be in a different perspective. We need to get those things in perspective so we know exactly what we're talking to God about. And as we begin to pray about our fears and our worries and everything else, we take that moment to get in our minds and wrap around all of this great power that God holds within us. Now through all of this, Paul does something very interesting. Paul attaches the words and he says, by supplication, and then he says, with thanksgiving. You know that prayer can be very frustrating business at times. It's like going to the Coke or Pepsi machine, putting the coins in the slots, pushing the buttons of what you want, and nothing comes out. Or that little spirally thing that has the, the, the bottle in there that is supposed to drop it so you can get it, sticks, and you see the bottle dangling there. When that happens, you just want to grab that machine, kick it, force it, say a few words, <laughs> but there you go. That's how prayer works in any case. Paul tells us to bring all of our worries, and I mean all of our worries, to God with thanksgiving. Believe me, we're not thanking God for the problem that's causing us to worry, but we're inviting God into that space for a specific situation. However, our thanksgiving is that demonstration of faith, of God's goodness and provision, despite of what anything is happening or seeing at that given moment. As I mentioned last week, Satan is the master liar and the deceiver. And as we heard in part of the gospel lesson this morning, John is debating with some of those Jewish leaders on the day. And when we heard in the part of John this morning that we heard that your children of the devil and children want to do their parents' will. The devil was a murderer from the beginning and is not grounded in truth because there is no truth in it. When the devil lies, it speaks its native tongue. The devil is a liar, all sources of all lies. Now that's pretty strong language in my book and why Jesus would speak such strong terms, especially to the religious leaders. Now if you haven't figured it out, here the leaders were being deceived and not, but Jesus was saying to them, when Satan lies, as we heard, then Satan's tongue is negative. And as we heard, not only does it spread that vicious lie that constantly is at work and blinding people from the truth that is separating them from having that relationship with Christ. But Satan is also deceiving and lying to these followers of Jesus from things of thinking that would be bringing them the freedom, the things that would cause us from being set free, while also blinding us and from fully becoming more devoted to God and God's ways. This is what happens when we believe a lie. Satan actually takes ground from our lives and things that do not belong to Satan. While Satan doesn't own it, it's all ready to be set up in the house that goes to work of influencing our thoughts until our actions are influenced, ultimately trying to destroy us. But what Paul is telling us is that we have to think about the right things that are true, but where do we find that truth? Well, we find that truth in God's word and God's ways that we do things. And at the beginning of the gospel lesson this morning, John is saying, if you live according to my teachings, you really are my disciples. Then you'll know the truth. And the truth, we all know what comes to that, the truth will set you free. Jesus tells us if we hold on to those teachings that we'll know the truth. And we know the truth that we have that ability to bring freedom into our lives and to set us free. From the lies, from the worries, from the doubt, from the unbelief, you see the Holy Spirit testifies on behalf of God's Spirit to those things that are true to rise. So we have to think on the things that are true and then to think on the things that are honorable and just, and this means that we need to think of the things that are worthy of respect, the things that are right there. Paul continues to tell us that if you are those followers of Jesus, 
to put those things before God and focus on them. In other words, don't focus on those things that bring dishonor to God and then allow those things to control you, but to honor it. Paul tells us to think about the things that are pure. And now when Paul does this to the church of Philippi, they were under Roman influence. And at that time, Roman culture was immersed in sexual perversion. There were naked statues everywhere. There were orgies going on. There were all kinds of immorality going on at that time, which of course caused temptation for these believers everywhere they turned. But Paul tells us to think about those things and think about the lovely things that can come of being said, of concentrating, of promoting that peace rather than conflict. Focus on the positive rather than the negative. People that are positive are more attractive to be around. And believe me, there is nothing wrong with being a crucial thinker and being positive. Because if you're one who is always creating conflict or you're stirring up the strife or you're stirring up trouble, you are playing the devil's advocate, which in other words is just being the devil. People eventually will cut you off. They will unfollow you. They will lose, you, you will lose your influence. They will even stop listening because they'll begin to think that you're a joy stealer. This is why Paul is telling us to think about the things that are lovely. The things that would be a motive of love. And he comes back and tells us to think about the things that are commendable. Think about the things that are work, worth talking about. Plain and simple, Paul says, think about the things that you would want God to hear. Things that would make God proud to be a part of your conversation. Paul further tells us to think about the things that are excellent, praiseworthy. Those excellent thoughts that motivate us to do better. Those praiseworthy thoughts that cause us to do better. Think about how much time we've spent letting our minds drift into the world just to tear us apart and the things that make us feel bad about ourselves. Think about how much time we spend swelling and dwelling those negative thoughts that we have on other people. Because most of the time, people don't even know that we're thinking those negative thoughts about them. I mean, come on. You know that we are all those ones that were nice to their face, and the minute they turn their back, we're pushing the daggers right into their back. We cannot dwell on those things that tear us apart or tear us down, or even tear us to the other end. We have enough going on in our lives every moment. We have been called to do so many great things of letting our minds to be positive and not to be brainwashed and turn, excuse me, and wrapped up in the turmoils. Because of all of this, we get robbed of that joy that takes away that peace from us. It causes the things to tear up with inside. We have to remember that God who brings that peace into our hearts is the God who brings the joy. Paul says it's the God of peace. Because God is there by our sides telling us that we should be. We know that God is right by our sides taking charge each and every moment of our lives. Which gives us that peace knowing that God is right there assuring the peace. Any of us can walk into our fears, walk into those doubts, walk into things that overwhelm us. But we just need to remember to hold on to God's hand and to know that how big those things are going to be, but God is there. God doesn't ask us to tip over those sacred cows, especially the cows of worry, because we've been given everything we need right in the place of our hands to know that Jesus and God is there. So when we build our lives on the right kind of framework, the right kind of prayer, and of course the right kind of thinking that we can rest assured that God has our back. If you've tried, if you've tried having anything to tip over of that sacred cow in your life, know that God is there to help you. God will tip it over for you. So I bring you peace and blessings this morning, Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church. Amen. Amen. Amen.